Hey church family, my name is Taylor Braswell. I'm one of the pastors here and we are so excited you've joined us online today to worship and hear from God's Word. Hey, we've loved hearing from you during this time and want to continue to know what's going on in your life and in the life of your family so that as a church and church staff, we can be praying for you and coming alongside you. You can actually send us an email at pray at fbcfm.com. Today, Pastor Jeff Bedwell will be finishing up his sermon series titled, It's All About Jesus. We pray this message strengthens you as we celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. Fall is stand before the throne. 
Merry Christmas to you. Whether you're online or here on campus, uh, we're delighted that you've uh, had as part of your preparations for Christmas, journeying with us in this Advent season as we've been seeking to remind ourselves about Jesus Christ, that it, Christmas really is all about Him. As we come to this final message in this series, I, I, I want to start off and just uh, think about questions. You know, Christmas time, we often ask questions. Uh, for adults, we might say, hey, what are your plans? What are y'all doing for Christmas this year? For children, we usually ask something about, what do you want for Christmas? And very often they have a really, really, really long list, don't they? A few years ago, Wired Magazine ran an article on the five best toys ever. Now, you have to understand, Wired is, is kind of an innovative, bleeding-edge publication on all things technology. And so when you read their list, it was actually a little bit surprising until you came to appreciate their angle. Here was their list of five best toys. Stick, box, string, cardboard tube, and dirt. <laughs> well, if you think about it, it's kind of a little bit hard to argue with their list, isn't it? Those five toys can be almost anything in the entire world. And maybe it's a good reminder for us this Christmas that some of the best things in life are the simple things. Whether it's in our life personally, our family, our business, our leadership, our ministry, some of the best things are the simple things. And so as we wrap up this series, I want to just come back to two very simple, basic, fundamental questions. And those two questions are kind of around this whole Christmas story. And the first is, how did the Son of God come to earth? And the second is, why? Why did the Son of God come to earth? Well, the answer to the first question is, incarnation. Incarnation. And we looked a little bit at that last week. Getting back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Fullness uh, means completeness or totality. The, the, the completeness of God, the totality of God was pleased to dwell in the body of Jesus Christ. First, that body that was in that manger in Bethlehem. Later in Colossians, the next chapter, he says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And dwells there is to be at home. And not just for a visit, but it's to be at home permanently. That we, He dwelled, the fullness, the totality of God made its home, came to dwell permanently in Jesus Christ. And that's the testimony of Scripture. John's Gospel starts off a little differently. It doesn't start off with a manger and a baby, but it starts off even before that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt. There's that word, dwelt among us. He, he came to be at home among us. We've been kind of tracking through this series with uh, the words of Charles Wesley and his uh, hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And, and those words we, we glanced at last week, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. God with us. How did God come to the earth? He came through the incarnation to be with us. God in the flesh. But the second question is the one I want to spend the most time on today. And that is, how, why did he come to the earth? Why did he come to the earth? And the answer to that second question is reconciliation. The purpose was reconciliation. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his 
cross. He came for the purpose of reconciliation. Let's keep letting Charles Wesley be our guide here. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. He came for the purpose of reconciliation. But in order to appreciate that, we we need to get the larger picture. So let's unpack that in the moments that we have together today. The first is the need for reconciliation. Why was there a need for reconciliation? Look, if you will, at verse 21. Paul describes the Colossians before they came to faith in Christ. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Paul gives us kind of this word picture. He uses three striking word pictures to describe our condition prior to the cross of Jesus Christ. He says we were alienated. Uh, We just didn't have a little tiff, a little misunderstanding, but we were radically separated, alienated, apart from a holy God because of our sin. We were hostile in mind, that we, we had a hostility toward God, that we had rejected His love, we had rebelled against His authority so that our posture was a posture of hostility in our mind, in our thinking, in our our actions and our attitudes toward a holy God. There was this alienation, this separation, this hostility, and that gave way to evil behavior. Evil behavior, that we became evil in our behavior, and that certainly doesn't mean everything that we do is as evil as it possibly can be, but it means that even our best behavior is tainted that there is, there is a, an evil component to it. There's a component of even our best days and our best motives are, are tainted by mixed motives and uh, mixed ways and whys that we do things. And so our behavior, and we see it in our world, we see sometimes atrocious, horrible things. That is a result of what happens as we distance ourselves from God. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he summed it up with these words, and you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That is my condition apart from Christ. That is the condition of every human being apart from Christ. We're not necessarily as bad as we can be, but we are as bad off as we can be because we are separated, alienated from God. We are in need of reconciliation. But there's not only the need for reconciliation, but Paul begins to describe for us the way of reconciliation the way of reconciliation we already looked at verse 20 let's just circle back and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross verse 22 he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him that what he did was make a way a way for us to be reconciled and that way is through the life the death the burial and the resurrection of jesus christ paul summarizes it very neatly and succinctly in his second letter to the corinthians for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. He he came and he he lived that, that life of perfect love and a perfect obedience. He was without sin. And yet he made him, he took on our sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now let me let me give you a little bit of theology here uh, that that may help to unpack this even a little bit more. I want to give you two theological words, so hang with me for a moment. The first word is propitiation. Propitiation. I realize that's not a word you tend to use in your everyday language but propitiation is the absorbing and the exhausting of the righteous wrath 
of a holy God against our sin. For God to be just, for God to be holy, for God to be fair, for God to be right and righteous, He has to have a fixed holy wrath against sin sin. It is against his nature. It is against his creation. It damages people. And so it it is only righteous for him to have a fixed wrath, a fixed hatred against sin. And propitiation is one part of what Christ did for us, that God poured out that righteous wrath, fully exhausting it, that Christ absorbed it all for us so that paul would write to the thessalonians this this encouraging word for god has not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through our lord jesus christ that because he has poured out that wrath on christ we don't have to absorb it we can be set free we can be reconciled john would later write in this the love of god was made manifest among us that god sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, there's our word, for our sins. He loved us so much that He sent His Son. God became flesh, the incarnation, to absorb, to exhaust the righteous wrath of a holy God against sin. But you can think of this as a two-sided coin. Not only is there propitiation, but there is also expiation. Expiation, again, not a word you use all the time. Expiation is the removal or the putting away of sin from the presence of of a holy God, that sin cannot exist, stand in the presence of a holy God. And so we have these promises in Scripture that God is going to act to remove our sin. We see it in the Old Testament. Isaiah the prophet, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Sometimes we remember things. We remember things from our past, sometimes with great shame and even horror. But God says, I I do not hold that against you, that I am removing that from you. Hebrews 8 says, For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That God no longer holds it against us. There's a wonderful Old Testament picture that, and remember, so much of the the things in the Old Testament uh, point forward to their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And one of those great, great pictures is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16. And there's this picture of the, the scapegoat. On the Day of Atonement, once a year, this high holy day, they would have these these two goats, and they would demonstrate this dual purpose, this propitiation and expiation. That one goat would be selected for sacrifice, and one would be driven away. So the one that was sacrificed was symbolic of of the covering by shed blood of the wrath of God, the, the righteous wrath of God. So the absorbing of that wrath. But on the other goat, they would symbolically lay their hands on that goat as if laying all the sins of the people upon that goat. And then that goat would be driven off. It was that picture of expiation, of driving away, of removing our sin from the presence of a holy God. That's why there's a Christmas. That's why He came, so that He could provide the way of reconciliation. But did you notice that we read at the end of verse 22 kind of the results of reconciliation? The results of reconciliation. He talks about in order to present you holy, and blameless above reproach before him 
He used three words to describe our condition before. Those three pictures, those three word pictures of our alienation and hostility and evil behavior. And now he comes in and he puts along three words that describe reconciliation. But the results of reconciliation are personal but they also have another dimension. Let's look personally first. Personally, that's where these three words we just read come into play. Personally, he says, now, if you are in Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, now God looks at you as holy, that you have been separated from sin. You have been set aside for him and for his purposes. He now sees you through Jesus Christ as one who is holy. But not only holy, but he uses the word blameless. Some translations will say without blemish. A sacrifice in the Old Testament had to be without blemish. Jesus was the only sacrifice because he was without blemish. He was personally without sin. And that blamelessness, that lack of blemish is now transferred to us if we are in Jesus Christ. So now we are are holy we are blameless without blemish and we are above reproach we are free from accusation we are free from accusation that the, 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 the enemy of our soul may try to fling accusation at it. who do you think you are after what you've done and where you've been and what you've said and how could you think you've been forgiven but I, I can know I can know those accusations no longer apply to me they no longer stick to me because I am in Jesus Christ and I am now holy and I am blameless and I am free from the accusations of the enemy but I want you to see something here that the results of reconciliation are not just personal and that's certainly where we start and perhaps appropriately so but there is also a, a cosmic dimension to this. It's not only personally, but it's also cosmically. He hinted at that in verse 20. I want to slip back there. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, the implications of sin, the implication of Adam's sin, the implication of continuing sin in all of our lives is not just personal, but it also affects all of creation. Because mankind was designed as the crown of God's creation, to be the, the head, the, the steward under God of all of His creation. And when we sin, it affects not only us, but it affects other people. It affects creation. And so Paul would write about the nature as, as, as longing for reconciliation and redemption. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, that reconciliation to take place. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. We live in a world where there's still the, the, we're still subjected to sin and we see it. We see it in, in bodies that, that break down, in disease, in pandemics. We see it in, in natural evil. We see it in hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and famine and all of these things. And there's this, this groaning of creation to be set free, to be set free from its bondage, the bondage that was created by the reality of sin and so we look forward in the words of Peter but according to his promise we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness 
dwells, in which sin will be no more. So that the results of reconciliation are not just that you and I can be restored to a right relationship to God, but it also resets creation. It it remakes creation. There is a new heaven and a new earth coming, and now we groan. Creation groans in longing for that. So when you think about that babe in Bethlehem, it's not just a cute, warm little story, but it is a story with cosmic implications because sin had cosmic implications. And again, our Christmas hymns remind us of this. It teaches this. Joy to the world is one of the favorites we like to sing at Christmas time. Let me just remind you of some of the words of that hymn. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and then we sing, and heaven and nature sing. Why would heaven and nature sing? Because there are cosmic implications of Jesus coming. Second verse, joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. This picture of of creation repeating the sounding joy. The third verse, no more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found far as the curse is found. No wonder we sing joy to the world. It's not just the world of people, but it is all creation that is impacted by this reconciliation. But I also want you to see something very, very important, and that is the condition. The condition of reconciliation. Look at verse 23. If indeed... If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. There is a condition of reconciliation. And that condition is being in the faith that he talked about if indeed you continue in the faith he wasn't saying that you can jump in and out of this but he is saying that that if you are genuinely in the faith if you are genuinely in christ if you are genuinely reconciled to christ then that continues it may have a definitive beginning point but it has continuing impact continuing display in our life richard Mellick was co- commenting on this verse and he said they were encouraged to continue in the faith There was no doubt that the genuine believers would continue. Even more, the fact that they did continue evidenced the reality of their commitments. The condition was not just a a religious ceremony. It was not just walking an aisle or being baptized or being confirmed at one point in your life. The evidence was uh, of faith that continued, that you continued firm and steadfast in that faith. And Paul had that confidence of these folks that he was writing to. In fact, is in the next chapter, he said, for though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. He was affirming their continuing in that faith. And so I want to want to make sure I'm crystal clear on this today. And I want you to think about the condition of reconciliation around these words. The first word is a recognition. A recognition of my condition apart from the intervening work of Jesus Christ. Uh, Of recognizing it's not just other people. It's not just people who seem to be less moral or more evil than me. But I, I am in need of reconciliation. I, 
personally have rebelled against the righteous and just rule of a holy God. I personally have rejected His love toward me. I personally am in need of reconciliation. And I can't do anything about it on my own. And that leads to the second word, and that is renunciation. Renunciation, that I come to that point and I renounce. I I renounce any thought that I can earn God's love or favor or approval or or reconciliation on my own. I renounce self-rule and self-righteousness. That I no longer am going to be the director or the boss of my own life, but I recognize Him as the rightful leader and Lord of my life. I recognize that I have to rely fully and completely on him so i renounce self-rule and i renounce any hint of self-righteousness and then there is reliance reliance that i rely fully and completely on the finished work of jesus christ that he came and did for me what i could not do for myself that god became flesh and he lived that life of perfect love and perfect obedience that was to be mine he died the death that i deserved to die his blood was shed to absorb the full righteous holy wrath of god against sin and that he has removed my sin for me so that i rely fully and completely on him and again i just want to point to some hymns because they're so rich the rock of ages we sometimes sing that song nothing in my hands i bring simply to the cross i cling the solid rock my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness no merit of my own i claim but wholly lean on jesus name i rely fully and completely on him no merit of my own i claim but wholly lean on jesus name and then when that becomes true when by his grace through faith through reliance upon him entrusting to him my past my present and my future i can begin to rejoice i can begin to rejoice that's why the theme of christmas throughout christmas woven in the christmas narratives is joy because there is joy that god has done for me what i could never have done for myself god rescued me god reconciled me when i didn't even desire it when I certainly didn't deserve it that he did for me what I could not do for myself and there is joy in that and it changes the way that I live life it changes the way that I even deal with the difficult things in a broken world Paul summarizes it in these words in 2nd Corinthians 5 therefore if anyone is in Christ He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the hope of Christmas. That's the joy and the invitation and the commissioning and the calling of Christmas. I want to pull this together with a story. And let me just read part of that to you, if I may. Justin was seething. He had just been grounded from driving the family car. Not for a week, not even for a month, but indefinitely. Justin was only a few weeks past his 16th birthday, the day he had finally gotten his driver's license. Now he had been ticketed for speeding, 50 miles per hour in a 30 miles per hour zone. 
but he wasn't too concerned about the four penalty points against his driver's license or even the hefty fine he'd have to pay. In a sense, that was a badge of honor, a rite of passage in the crowd that he had started running with. What really got to Justin was losing the privilege of driving the family car. What would his friends think? Instead of being cool, he'd be laughed at. Even worse, his best friend Tony had been with him when his mom and dad made their pronouncement. No more driving their car until he changed his rebellious attitude. Justin's pleading soon escalated to ranting and raving and then to outright belligerence. This wasn't the first conflict he had had with his parents. In fact, his rebellious attitude had been growing. Been growing steadily since he had made some new friends at school a couple of years ago. His parents had firmly and consistently tried to rein him in, but to no avail. And this was the last straw for Justin. He wasn't going to take it anymore. I'm getting out of here, he announced defiantly to his parents. I'm going to go live with Tony. His parents aren't old-fashioned and strict like you. They let Tony do whatever he wants, and I'm going to have a life. With that, Justin stomped off to his room, where he hastily threw some of his clothes into a duffel bag. Returning back through the living room, he gave his parents not so much as a glance or even a word of goodbye. He slammed the front door and headed for Tony's car at the curb. Justin got more than he bargained for at Tony's house. For one thing, Tony was always bickering with his two younger brothers. Worse yet, the parents constantly yelled at the boys and each other. One night, Tony's dad came home drunk and began to curse at and threaten them. Justin was shaken. He had never been cursed at before in his home. Still, he felt like he couldn't go home. He had defied his parents and he couldn't back down. Too much pride. Tony's mother never cooked for them. She sent out for pizza or pick up something at the supermarket deli. At first, this was great. No more eat your vegetables edicts like Justin had grown up with. But after a while, it started to grow old. He began to remember his mom's good cooking, something he'd always taken for granted. He could almost taste her meatloaf. He started to think more and more about home. He remembered how his dad had always been there for him. He thought of his mother's care and how she had driven him to so many soccer games, a sport that he had really loved until he had begun to run with a new crowd. Slowly, Justin began to come to his senses. He realized that the total freedom Tony had wasn't a mark of his parents' love, but rather their indifference. With that came the realization that his own parents' attempt to deal with his rebellion was a demonstration of their love for him. Maybe being a bit old-fashioned wasn't so bad after all. After all, his dad never came home drunk. Justin's mind was made up. He'd call his mom right now. Mom, Justin began slowly, I want to come back home. It was a request, not an announcement. He knew very well what a pain he had been to his parents the last couple of years, and he wasn't sure what response he'd get. You do? His mom responded with a slight hesitation in her voice. She had no idea what to expect if Justin returned. Would it be more of the same rebellious spirit? Would he continue trying to take advantage of them? Would the same old tensions flare up? Justin's heart sank as he detected her hesitancy. What if they wouldn't take him back? What would he do? He was sick of Tony's house. Yeah, I do, Mom, I really do. Now there was just a hint of pleading in his voice, and he really did want to go home. His mother's heart went out to her son. She sensed the pleading in his voice. Why don't you come on home, and when your dad gets home, we'll talk about it. Okay, Mom. I'll be there by six. Justin said with hope in his voice, but as he hung up the phone, he wasn't hopeful. Had he forever ruined his relationship with his parents? Justin waited to return until his father came home from work. He wanted to talk to both mom and dad together. Furthermore, he asked Tony to drive him home and to come in while he talked to them. He had rehearsed what he would say, and he wanted Tony to hear it. Mom and dad, he said, I'm sorry for the way I've treated you the last two years. I've been a real jerk. But I've come to realize you attempted to deal with my rebellion, not because you're old-fashioned, but because you love me. And now I want to change. I want my life to be like it was before. 
I want to be the obedient and happy son I used to be. Will you forgive me and take me back? Justin was thoroughly chastened and repentant. And mom and dad, I was belligerent towards you in front of Tony. And so I asked him to come in and to hear what I said to you. He heard me defy you, so it's only right that he should hear me ask for your forgiveness. And then turning to Tony, he said, Will you also forgive me for mistreating my parents in your presence? Tony was taken aback. Never in his entire life had he heard anyone ask for forgiveness of someone else. He didn't know what to make of it. He just stammered, Sure, man. I better get going. And with that, he beat a hasty retreat out the front door. Justin's mother and father moved quickly to embrace Justin and assure him of their forgiveness. After dinner, they settled down in the living room where Justin shared the lessons he had learned and the changes he wanted to make. His parents were obviously thrilled and promised to help Justin regain the kind of life he had lived before. That night, Justin was reconciled to his parents. That's Christmas. Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. And so today, I take on the mantle of Christ's ambassador. As an ambassador for Christ, God making His appeal through me, I implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Recognize the reality of your sin and rebellion. Re come to, to renounce any self-righteousness or self-rule. Come to rely fully and completely on the finished work of Jesus Christ and know the joy, the joy of being forgiven, the joy of being made a new creation in Jesus Christ. This Christmas, I implore you, if you've never received it before, receive the greatest gift of all, reconciliation to God. God, made possible through Jesus Christ. Pray with me if you would, please. Father, thank you. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for all that it represents, all that it reminds us of, all the reasons it gives us for joy. Father, thank you that you took such a radical step to give up the glories of heaven, to become human to live and to die in our place so that we might be cleansed, forgiven, reconciled, and restored. And Father, I pray right now for those that are listening to the sound of my voice that they would hear your voice, that in this moment you would draw them home. In this moment, in their own words, in the core of their being, they would recognize, confess their sin against you. They would renounce any self-rule and self-righteousness. And they would rely fully and completely on the finished work of Jesus Christ, His life, death, burial, and resurrection. And that they would entrust themselves past, present, and future to you, opening their life to receive you as not only forgiver, Savior, but leader and Lord. And Father, I pray that in their heart you would seal the joy of reconciliation, the hope of a new creation, the life that only comes possible through Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. If we can help you at all, 
to understand more about what it means to be reconciled to Jesus Christ, if we can help you to begin to take some of those first steps as a follower of Jesus Christ, to follow Him in the waters of baptism, to begin to walk in a new life and grow and develop in Jesus Christ, please, please reach out to us. Reach out to us personally. Pick up a phone, send an email, go to our website, fbcfm.com, click the Next Steps tab. Let us know how we can help you take your next step or just continue this conversation along the way but as we bring this to a close I just want to leave you with a few questions to make this personal are you right now continuing in the faith stable and steadfast not shifting from the hope of the gospel that's the descriptor of the the condition of those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not just about did you have a religious moment somewhere in your life, but are you right now today continuing to walk in that faith? Is the joy of reconciliation evident in your life this Christmas? I know this has been a hard year, and for some of you it's been particularly hard. But there is a joy in the life of those who know that they are in Jesus Christ. Is that joy evident in your life this Christmas? And then if you are in Jesus Christ, you have a calling. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. How can you serve as an ambassador for Christ? How will you share the good news of great joy this Christmas? Who are you going to do that with? Let us go forth, continuing steadfastly in the faith and joyously sharing it as God gives opportunity. Merry Christmas and God bless you. We hope today's message encouraged you and strengthened your relationship with Christ. If you feel like God's working in your life and you have any questions about our church or about the sermon you just heard, we would love to come alongside you. You can email us at pray at fbcfm.com. Again, we want to thank you so much for giving during this time. Your generosity continues to help make resources like this available. You can give online at fbcfm.com slash give. Again, we want to continue the conversation with you throughout this week on social media. Thank you so much for joining us today.